So it's, it's uh, a great pleasure for me to introduce our, our speaker this morning, sponsored by Beef and Lamb Genetics. So first of all, thanks to Beef and Lamb Genetics for uh, sponsoring uh, Lee Leachman to come and, and speak to us today. I've uh, known Lee for a, a number of years from when I was in, in Canada, and Lee has a, an economics degree from, from Harvard, and their family was in the cattle business for a number of years in Montana. Lee moved the business to Colorado in 2003, and he'll talk a bit about all the, the bulls they sell, but uh, basically they've got experience around the world in, in Brazil and South America, Paraguay, Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, people here would be familiar with the Risingtons and Absalons and Stabilizer cattle, and they basically originate with, uh, with Lee Leachman. Yesterday, or on Monday, talking with scientists and um, a, a similar theme came up a few times, and that is one of the challenges we have as scientists is actually adoption. So getting farmers to take results and apply them. Um, and I think after the talk today, you'll realize if we had 50% um, of our farmers were Lee Leachman, actually adoption's not the problem. So he sees, he sees an opportunity, and he grabs it and runs with it. So and without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Lee. Thank you, Steve. Am I on? Well, it's uh, good to be here this morning. Thank you to uh, Beef and Lamb Genetics for bringing me down. I actually have the opportunity to bring my family with. I, they're not here because I told them I was going to speak at 9.30, Pat, instead of 8.30. So they're going to be an hour late, and they're much happier, I'm sure, sleeping right now than hearing me speak, so that's probably okay. Um, I will uh, just uh, give a little background on our company to kind of start with. Um, the topic I'm going to speak about is how to build a more profitable cow herd. And this is very much um, the type of presentation that we would give to a fairly lay audience, an audience of uh, cow-calf producers in the United States who would be potential customers of ours. And that's what the talk is designed to do. I did put some genetic trends in. I figured that most of you would want to see genetic trends, so I put those slides in this morning. They're actually not in the paper that's printed. The only thing that's surprising is that most of you have higher degrees, and yet you still want to sit in the back of the room. So I'm. I'm just kind of wondering about that trend. I kind of thought you'd be at the front of the room. But anyway, um, a little bit of background. Um, by now you know that I'm a bull shipper from Colorado. And you have to say that very carefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gets a little deep. But uh, I, 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 you know, why am I qualified to talk about profitable cowherds, and particularly this far from home? I'm, I'm almost guaranteed to be an expert because I'm several thousand miles from home. But I am a third generation seed stock producer. My father was in the business, my grandfather was in the business, and basically for three generations, we've made our money selling genetics to beef cattle producers. Very different production schemes and selection criteria over those several, uh, several decades, but uh, nonetheless, third generation. Like our president in the United States, I am from Harvard University. My dad <laughs> sent me there, he said, this way you won't learn any animal science that I'll have to unteach you. Uh, that was his commentary before he sent me, but he did tell me not to become a Democrat and not to come back with an earring. So I think if it were in this day and age, his, his cautions would have been even more strident, I'm sure, as uh, other things might have preoccupied him. But uh, I did go broke in 2003. I think that's always very pertinent. That was very expensive. It was far more expensive than going to Harvard, and it was far more educational than going to Harvard. And it, and it does uh, temper a lot of the things that we do and, and how we even approach our business. And I think uh, in many ways, I, you know, you can almost characterize my career so far as the pre-years and the post-years. And I often reflect now on how much my decision-making has changed. I can remember back in the earlier years where I would always be impatient with those who wanted to be conservative. And now I'm very conservative. <laughs> and so that's, that's uh, just a change in, in the way we look at things. And as I mentioned, I have made my living off of cattle for the last 27 years. Um, what kind of bulls do we raise? We raise Angus, and Red Angus, and Stabilizers. Um, the Stabilizer is a composite that started out copying a blend that was developed by Agricultural Research Service at USDA. They called it a Mark II. It was developed at the uh, Clay Center Nebraska Research Station. And they basically built a Gelvy Simmental Hereford Red Angus. And those cattle were red and horned, red and white and horned actually. Um, and as the market in the United States moved towards black and polled, we modified the cattle and selected in that direction. Um, we raise those um, genetics and select them to maximize cow-calf profitability, those three maternal breeds. 
Then we select our Charlet on terminal traits. So they're selected just for birth to harvest terminal traits. Um, we produce bulls through a network of cooperators. So we have now 35 herds in the United States that we specify the matings, they make the matings, they turn in the data, we select the males that we want. We bring those males to a centralized location, which is in Colorado in the center of the United States. We evaluate those males, we then send them out to a variety of marketing locations around the United States. We put about 1,500 bulls on test each year, so we're sampling about the top half of those male calves. Um, since 2004, we've marketed about 13,000 bulls, so we are, I think we're in the top three or four in the United States in terms of volume at this standpoint. Um, and uh, we also do a little bit of export work. Not a big part of our business, but we send some genetics here um, to Focus and Rissington historically. And then we also uh, send genetics into Australia, into the UK, and some into South America. So that's just kind of an overview, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. Almost everything I'm going to talk about is about selection of those beef cattle and how we position that in the marketplace and how we try to market that to our customers. So the, the thing that we start out with our customers is, 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 what are, is what are the keys to herd profitability? And I think it's interesting that as we talk to ranchers in the United States, understanding that most of the ranchers that we're selling bulls to would own their cows. They would be typically in the 500 cow range, probably on average, so fairly big producers, primarily located in the western United States. The only seats left are the good ones in the front row now. <laughs> so they're in the western United States. They would typically be family-run operations. They would be running on large expanses of acreage, typically using over 10 hectares per cow to run their their cattle on their cow on a yearly basis, um, and yet they're very confused about what drives their profitability generally. They're, they're typically selling those calves at weaning time. Some of them would retain them and graze them after weaning and sell them on out to a year of age. Hardly any of them, less than 10% of them say, would actually carry those animals through the fattening stage in the feedlot and sell them to a packing plant. So we ask them, you know, what drives their profitability? Typically they think about weaning weight as being their sale weight, and that would be the primary driver. Or their sale price, if you sit around the coffee shops in our part of the world, everybody this time of year is talking about, did you hear about that set of calves that brought such and such per pound? And they are just astronomical figures. Just to give you an idea right now, um, if you're selling a yearling age animal that, say, weighs 375 kgs, that animal in U.S. dollars is worth over $2,000 a head now. Okay. So the market is, by historical standards, in unprecedented territory on a market price. Um, you know, sale revenue per head is a big driver. Sale revenue per cow is maybe a better driver. Cost per cow, nobody wants to talk about. Annual cow cost in the United States right now, by most estimates, if you include the rental fee for the grass, so an opportunity cost for the grass, um, are pushing $700 per cow. So these numbers are really high, and, and a big chunk of that is, is the grazing cost. Profit per cow, very few people would have a handle on that, and almost nobody would be thinking in terms of dollars per land mass, dollars per acre, dollars per hectare. That, that thought process is really unheard of in North America. Um, very, very few of our customers would think about that. So we're trying to get them to think about that. We think that is the driver. They own land mass. They want to maximize the revenue that they can generate off that land mass or the, the profitability. Stocking rates obviously critical. Herd health is critical, but I don't like to talk about those things. I like to talk about genetics. So we're going to talk about how genetics affects dollars profit per acre to a cow-calf producer in North America. So we start out with cow herd genetic drivers for profit output. Um, is, is obviously one of the keys, what does her calf weigh, but reproduction and longevity are big drivers. And uh, from a genetic standpoint, we basically have three sets of genetic prediction that will characterize that. One is heifer pregnancy, what percentage of those females breed at 15 months of age. Days to conception, which characterizes from the beginning of breeding season to when that female conceives, is she breeding earlier or later? We try to do that to separate out the gestation effect. And then stability, does she stay in the herd? What percentage of those cows are still in the herd at six years of age? And then, of course, cow cost. And really, that, that pretty well captures what drives profit for that rancher. We could talk about price per pound when they sell the calf, but basically, what does that calf weigh? How many of them are there? And what was the cost to produce it? And so we've, we've done a pretty good job in beef cattle genetics at 
increasing the weight. We've increased milk production and growth rate. That increases the weight of that calf. We've done a pretty lousy job on these low heritability traits. They're hard to measure. They're not very heritable. We haven't made a lot of progress. Fortunately, hybrid vigor impacts them highly. And we've done almost nothing to characterize how our genetics affect cost. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. One of the problems with this traditional selection using EBVs is that we increase output and we find the ones that grow faster and we find the ones that milk more and the results are we get calves that grow faster and heifers that get bigger and cows that weigh more and cows that milk more. But that output is not profit. At the end of the day, higher growth animals reach larger weights at a given age. But why do they do that? We're in a room of geneticists. So why do those animals, what's going on there? Why do those animals reach larger weights at a given age? What's the number one thing we've changed? Pardon me? Adult size has gone up, right? But why has adult size gone up? What's, what's the driver here? What's happening on a daily basis? They're eating more. I resemble that remark. That should have got a bigger laugh. Are you guys here? Are you awake now? Come on. You can laugh. It's OK. I, we're going to talk a lot about feed intake, and I resemble, you know, large feed intake. Um, do they eat the same and grow more? No, they eat more and grow more, right? And basic EPDs or EBVs have ignored the cost of that higher growth. We're typically in that camp in the United States. We advertise these great big yearling weight EPDs or 400-day weight EBVs, and we say bigger is better. And so if there's an animal that has an 80, and here's another animal that has 100, obviously the 100 is better than the 80. That's a better animal. It's going to drive more profit but you didn't look at the cost side, right? And the cost side said there was more feed consumed, we increased the cow size, what happens to fertility? Big question mark, okay? How big are beef cows in the United States today? Are the cows bigger than they were 10 years ago? Are they big enough? These are questions that we ask cow-calf producers. We're trying to change the thought process, okay? We say, when was the average sire of your mature cow herd born? This is a little retrospect, right? So say, what year was that? Most of them missed that quite significantly. It was actually 2006. It's nine years ago. If you figure that those bulls were used as yearlings, they were used in the herd for four years, and the average mature cow in the herd is between four and nine years of age, it works out the average herd sire that made the cows that are in the herd today was born nine years ago. So then it bears looking at what the genetic characterization of those animals was nine years ago when the average yearling EPD in the United States for Angus was around 70, and today we're up around 100. So we've, we've got these cows that are really big. We've increased the growth rate in the young sires, and we're going to be really surprised when our cows in the future are even bigger than they are today. We shouldn't be surprised, right? That's, that's, a, that's a natural result of the way we're selecting. And, and, and many of the cows in, in, that are producing these high-growth bulls in the United States, very easy to encounter cows that weigh over 1,700 pounds, or I guess, what is that, about... Uh, 750 kgs, is that about right? So big cows. Will those cows reproduce? Will they be efficient? This is an interesting chart. I gave a talk back, uh, gosh, almost a decade ago in Arkansas, not the most progressive part of the cattle rearing production system in the United States. And there was someone from the Extension Service on the program with me, and I got up and I said, you know, as we select these cows, bigger cows, our production per acre is actually going to go down. And so, of course, they went out and measured it. So they went out into these commercial herds in Arkansas, and they weighed the cows, and they weighed the calves at weaning. And that's the scatter, scatter plot from that. And the R squared's not very high, but the, the trend is very, very clear. And that is that as those cows increased in size, the percent of their body weight, this efficiency is percent of body weight, the percent of the body weight they wean goes down. And so if we do the standard calculus and we take body weight to the three-quarter power as a, as a prediction of metabolic weight, and then we factor in what those cows are going to eat on an acreage, it becomes very clear that as cow size goes up, production per acre goes down. Okay? And then you have the added kicker in the United States that as weight per head goes up, price per pound goes down. Okay? From a cow-calf marketing standpoint, weight per head at, at, at sale time, the higher that is, the lower that price per pound is going to be because the, 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 the contrary to, to popular opinion, everybody says, well, the fattening stage is the expensive part of the United States rearing system. No, it's the cheapest part. The expensive part is the cow-calf part. So those calves sell today in the marketplace for $2.50 to $3 per pound as stores cattle or feeder cattle, as we call them. 
and then they're cheapened up during the fattening stage when we put on weight at around 75 cents a pound. And so the net net of this is as we've increased this cow size, we've actually had a tremendous adverse effect on cow-calf profitability. Okay? Even though production per head was going up, production per acre, which is what their asset base is, was going down. And it's interesting. We can now go backwards using simulation models that actually came from Steve a long time ago, right, Steve? We go back and look at our genetic trend within our herd for overall predicted profitability from birth through harvest. And this is that trend, and it goes back into the 1980s and comes up to the 1990s. And that's basically flatline, right, which in medical terms is dead. Um, and and we, we were increasing growth rate in that herd very rapidly. But what we were gaining on growth rate, we were giving away on fertility and, and efficiency and feed intake and production per acre. And so we were basically flatlined for that period. And I came back in the organization right here, right before it dipped. So that was a tremendous impact I had. Um, <laughs> I can attribute that all to my education at Harvard. But, um, you know, we, we weren't measuring the right things. That's obvious. Or we weren't selecting for the right things. Let's put it that way. So then we start and into, the, into the 2000s when I moved to Colorado. We actually were very fortunate in that we moved into a uh, partnership with a business that owned a feedlot and they had 256 10 head pens. And so we sorted 1,000 bulls into sire groups and 10 head pens. We, we basically used an allocation model to allocate feed to with individuals within those pens. And then we gathered that data and we ran EBVs on it. And lo and behold, we found huge differences on feed conversion and intake between those bulls. No big surprise to anybody in the genetics business. We said, look, if those big sire differences exist, how do we select young sires to sample without knowing what they eat? We can't do it. So being, being kind of money-minded and cheap, we tried to build our own feed bunks. So we built these little bunks that had a load cells under it and a big steel case around it because our feed truck drivers don't speak English and they're not very good at not hitting the bunks. And as, as we, we feed the animal, then the scale records the weight and the EID reads off the animal's ear and the EID reader's in the bunk. And you can buy these from a company in Canada now for much cheaper than what we built them for. But suffice to say, we put those in and we started measuring the cattle. And when we did that, we were shocked at the variation in feed intake and feed conversion that we found in these bulls. Just shocked. So now we've measured over uh, 12,000 individual animals. That's, that's actually probably a dated slide. That number's probably closer to 14,000 now. And we've also then progeny tested animals out of those measured animals. So we've gathered lots and lots of feed intake data. Here's, here's a slide that I use that just shocks producers, okay? Here are two bulls that are born in the same pasture within three days of age, okay? They had approximately the same weight at 365 days of age, okay? One of those animals consumed 42 pounds of dry matter a day, and one of them consumed 17 pounds of dry matter a day. That's a big difference. Now, when these two animals were on test and we would have visitors come and we had this data, we would take them out into the pen, we would move those two animals away from the others and stand them in a corner, and we would say, who thinks it's the bull on the right and who thinks it's the bull on the left? And you could not tell phenotypically which bull it was. Okay? That's a difference of 9,000 pounds of feed per year. Okay? I mean, it's a shocking number. The one bull, the bull on the left actually was a better converter, the lower intake bull, converted four to one. The bull on the right <coughs> converted 10 to one. Okay? That trait's 40% heritable. We just do kind of back of the envelope math. We can run 112 of this bull's daughters on the same annual feed as 75 of this bull's daughters. Which herd makes more money? That's kind of a slam dunk, right? So this trait is highly heritable. It's hard to measure because you need one of these devices and you've got to measure it but it's a, a hugely significant trait. Obviously, if you're in swine genetics or poultry genetics, you've been selecting for it for decades. Um, so we have to do that in beef cattle at this point. Another profit driver is fertility and longevity, and hybrid vigor is the key to that. It's still shocking to us how few people crossbreed on a global basis, um, but it is the best way to improve that. It adds 23% more pounds weaned per cow exposed. The problems in the United States, it's hard to keep the uniformity. Angus is the dominant breed, and from a marketing standpoint, you have to have cattle that look like Angus to sell well in the marketplace, and preferably grade on a carcass basis like Angus. The solution now is to use hybrids and composites. They allow us to keep the uniformity, keep Angus type, and be competitive on carcass merit. So you see in the United States, basically there are two seed stock markets. There is Angus, 
and everything else that's now half Angus and half one of the other breeds is a hybrid. <coughs> and that's basically what's happened in beef cattle genetics in the U.S. The market's segmented into those two characteristic markets. And EPD's work on those hybrids, and so all that's in motion, and uh, we're making a lot of progress in the hybrids. But it's interesting that uh, obviously Angus is the largest breed, constituting about 40% of all the registrations in the United States. They're moving at a faster pace. One of the things that's been interesting is that as these other breeds have made hybrids and started to do genetic analysis on hybrid populations, their own genetic analysis said basically they'd be better off raising high percentage Angus. Now that's really detrimental to your breed association, so you can imagine some of the discussions that ensue after that realization. But now, we also are measuring what happens in the feedlots. Feedlot's a big driver in our industry. Um, we had a, the, the, the fortune of, of tying up with a feedlot that had gathered individual information on about 185,000 calves from about 2,500 different herds. So big database. <coughs> we went in and standardized that database for market price and for feed cost and for in weight. And when we got done with that, we did a factorial analysis. But basically, we found there was a $600 value spread from top to bottom. And that 35% of that value spread per head was driven by feed conversion. About another 30% was driven by what we call grid value, which is just a, what we use as a term to describe carcass merit per pound. Okay. So carcass value per pound was a driver of 30%. We'll talk about that. Carcass weight's a big driver. Again, if you buy the calf at an expensive price per pound and have to cheapen them up, the more pounds you can put on in the fattening stage, the more profitable that animal you purchase will be. And then herd health accounted for the other 17%. So we started measuring feed conversion in the bulls, and then we said we got to prove that to our feedlot constituents and customers. So we found a large herd in South Dakota that AI'd those cows. We AI'd 1,000 cows each year. We ended up with about 500 AI sired, well, no, 500 steers, of which about half were AI sired. We brought them to one feedlot on a given day. We backgrounded them for 70 days. We sorted them into sire pens on a given day. And then we, these were the EPDs of the different sire groups. Um, the next section shows you the number of heads. We had a lot of cleanup sires that came after the AI, and there was 200 head in that. We did uh, DNA type these two sets of cleanup sires, and then these were the AI sires. Here's the average daily gain per head, the dry matter intake per head. You can notice that this sire ranking is ranked from least efficient by our feed conversion EPD prediction to most efficient down at the bottom. And then here were the actual results in efficiency. And you can see that that prediction that we had on those bulls before we collected this data very accurately predicted the ending feed conversion differences. Um, there was about a 1.6 difference, and they ranked almost exactly like we predicted they were going to rank. And those are, those are pretty significant differences. It, at the market price, that was about $160 per head. So the commercial data lined up with the EBVs, and from top to bottom, we had a big difference in value. We did that in 2009. That fundamentally changed our business. It fundamentally changed our business because the people that buy the calves out of our bulls said that is the trait we want. That trait will drive our profitability. You put that into calves, we will pay for that. And so then we, we said we're going to actively select for that. The other thing that's going on is marbling is still a big driver of uh, consumer acceptability in the United States, fat in the beef. We kind of went through that whole trend where we said, well, the beef's too fat and we need to get it leaner. And the reality is today the consumers are telling us, no, we want the highly marbled beef. If we look at a study done at Colorado State University just a couple of years ago, these are um, different grading categories. Interestingly, the line between certified Angus beef, a, a very dominant brand in the United States, they draw the line right here. And this is just the percent acceptable by marbling score. And the average carcass in the United States, the average slaughter mix, is about 70% um, of our product is in these three categories, and less than 30% is in these two categories. The difference in value per head today between a prime and a low choice is $220 per head in the marketplace. Okay, So there's this huge premium on value. If you can get cattle up into the prime carcass range or even into the upper two-thirds choice, there's almost $100. <coughs> So 
we try to select for that. This is that same progeny test herd that did the feed efficiency study in 2012. 396 steers went 99% choice, 88% certified Angus, and 25% prime. The following year, the packer offered us a $220 cash premium for those cattle on a live weight basis. We sampled 105 of the 500 head that year, and uh, we had three prime yield grade ones and only one select. They, they went through the roof with 54% prime and 90% CAB. And so we, basically with genetics, we're, we're trying to push marbling, we're trying to push feed efficiency, we're trying to push profitability. The ranchers that we're selling to are not going to own all those calves all the way through to slaughter. So we have to connect the dots in the value chain. And so that, that's a complicated factor. If they're a commercial cow-calf rancher, how do they get paid? They typically sell their calves at weaning. Does any of that matter to them after weaning? We had to design a way that they could get paid for selling those calves at weaning. And so we got together with a company that does third-party certification. They came in and said, we're going to age and source verify because we don't have unique ID in the United States. There's no identification requirement in beef cattle. So they identify the calves with an EID and certify them and audit that. Then they document what they've done from a vaccination standpoint. And then we come in and give them a scorecard on average daily gain, ribeye area, carcass weight, yield grade, feed conversion, and percent choice. And then we actually predict what those calves are worth relative to national genetic average. That allows the feedlot to then pay a premium to those cow-calf producers. And we, we put this system in place, and it's being very well received. And it will change the way the, uh, the progressive ranchers are getting paid for their genetics. So basically, they can get paid for their post-weaning productivity and value without taking the risk of owning those animals all the way through to harvest. I'm going to run past this slide. So we've been through a whole bunch of traits, and, I, and usually at this point, I try to kind of step back and wrap it up and say, where, where are we really going? Because if I give this talk to a group of cow-calf producers, they're like, that was all really great, but are we supposed to have hybrid vigor? Are we supposed to worry about cow size or feed efficiency or marbling? We have all these traits. And, you know, they can add to that uh, reproduction, <coughs> uh, carcass merit. They always want to talk about structure and how the animals move. That's a big issue. But at the end of the day, do we really care about, care about any of those traits? The, the trait we, we want is profit. So we have to translate those component traits into profitability. And, and probably that's Steve and our relationship goes back to the early 2000s when we were looking for an index that would do that. And they had a simulation model that Steve developed. And that model predicted birth to harvest profitability. And, oops, and that's what we use for our selection at this point. And the selection index, uh, this is old hat, but I actually take time to, to go through this with producers, explaining what selection indexes are and who uses them and why they use them and that they in fact work, because our producers don't tend to get that. And this is a slide that I use that really drives that home as we compare 1957 chicken genetics and 2001 chicken genetics. These would be um, Ross line foundation chickens on the top and then current hybrids from 2001. Um, and, and obviously multi-trait selection worked. Now, we haven't done that in beef cattle, you know, because not only do those chickens grow faster and they're significantly heavier muscled, but they also use about a third less feed per pound of live weight gained. So that's tremendous progress. Can we do that in beef cattle? And so we use three profit indexes on each bull we produce. <laughs> we use one that's just from birth to weaning, which is profit that includes fertility, milk, and growth, and cow feed intake. We do one post weaning, which is profit from weaning to harvest, which is feed conversion, carcass value, and carcass weight. And that's also the index we use to predict the value of those feeder calves when they sell as stores cattle coming out of the, the ranch. And then we have a dollar profit index, which is our overall number, which combines the other two. And that is what we're selecting on. We're selecting on the overall birth to harvest index. And that's, that's the whole objective of our system. If you look at the average sire in our database compared to the top 1% sire, this is how the different traits change. Birth weight goes down, weaning weight and yearling weight go up. Milk stabilizes at about 22 pounds in our system. Days to conception becomes lower, so they breed earlier. Mature cow weight comes down. Feed intake goes down significantly. Feed conversion improves. Marbling goes up. Ribeye goes up. And interestingly, back fat goes up. We had a discussion yesterday talking about back fat and its genetic trend. 
And so basically when we look at the index and whether the index is functioning, we want to see all those traits moving in the right direction as we go toward the higher end of selection. And those cattle are better. Now here I put these genetic trends in just to show you where we are in genetic trend. Significant downward pressure on birth weight. I don't know if it's happening here, but in our country, the average age of our customers or of ranchers in the United States at this point is about 64 years of age. They are extremely sensitive to calving ease. If I want to lose a customer, the surest way to do that is to sell them a bull that gives them calving difficulty. And so we, we put a lot of downward pressure on birth weight, even though our models tell us that's not necessary from a profitability standpoint. Okay? It is necessary from a sales standpoint. Um, you're, oh, and I'll just back up. The, the green line is a genetic trend for Angus, which is 40% of the industry. The blue line is our genetic trend within our herd. Um, yearling weight, we're following them on, on yearling weight because still pounds sell. On uh, carcass weight, we're actually higher than Angus significantly. That's primarily driven by breed differences as we're using some of the European breeds in our composites. On mature weight, you see dramatically different trend lines, right? We're going downward on mature weight, they're not. And then this is probably the most interesting graph, I think. There's Angus's genetic trend on dry matter intake. Uh, that's their sharpest upward trend of any trait they're selecting for. Of course, they're not even really selecting for it, right? They're just starting to measure it. And then here's our genetic trend on dry matter intake. Um, so to summarize, if, if we can produce animals with less birth weight, high growth, upward trend on carcass value, downward selection for mature size, um, downward selection for feed intake, we're going to end up with more output and less input, and that's going to drive more profit to our customers. And uh, can we really move that fast is, is a big question. It's funny, as, as, as we print these numbers in our catalog, and obviously the economics have changed over the last decade. So we have customers come to us and say, how much of your change in your index figures being driven by the change <coughs> in the market? And we say, well, no, we, we take the market change out of that. We, we make the assumptions adjustment, but we scale it back to a constant market because we don't want that to go up and down based on market. This would be the average predicted index on the cow herd that's currently in place. They average about 9,000, and you see what's going on from a trend standpoint. Interestingly, we'll mate those cows this year, just finished mating season, just about now, to bulls that are 15.9, that makes the average calf born in 2016 a 12.6. We cull the bottom 50% of them. In 2017, the average animal we sell would be 14,000 on that index. To give you an idea, that would be about the same average as our herd sires were in our 2013 breeding season. So the entire product offering in 2017 We'll have the same average genetic merit as our elite AI herd sires did four years prior. You're really dragging your thoughts like Pardon me? You are seriously dragging your thoughts. We're moving like really quickly. Because yeah. that's that's they're gonna buy the average, and we have to move the average. What do they look like? This was a bull that was the top bull um, in 2013. He was number one on the profit <coughs> index, he was number one on all the indexes. He converted four to one. He was the bull that we did in the two bull comparison. Um, he had an intake of 17 pounds per day. He had a 17 square inch ribeye, which is what, about 114, I think, on uh, square centimeters. So he had a lot of ribeye, real high IMF scan, quiet. He was predicted to have a big birth weight to yearling weight spread. He does, but he's, he's not a calving yeast sire. Um, he had a very elite pedigree on our index. He had a, a very high profit projection. We now have 450 progeny out of him. And uh, he has uh, come in almost exactly where he was predicted to come in, which is, of course, the exception, not always the rule. Um, but he's one of the, the greatest breeding <coughs> bulls we've ever used. And uh, we sold, uh, I think, 52 of his progeny in our spring sale just several months ago, and they averaged over $10,000 per head. And so not only are we using the index and improving the cattle, but our customers are paying us for that. And, and we're seeing that as a dramatic change. If we go back to that slide, we talked about 1985 to 1995, no genetic change. From 95 to 2005, we started selecting primarily on end product merit. There were less antagonisms, so we made improvement. That improvement works out in hindsight to be about $2 per head per year. We're now moving at between $10 and $15 per head per year. If we look at the history of beef cattle selection, when we're at this stage, 
What advantage is there to use selected genetics? None. You can use selected genetics or unselected genetics, you're going to make the same trend on profit. When we were moving at $2 per head per year, there's a slight incentive, but in a decade's time, we only move $20. At this rate of change, it becomes more imperative that people adopt it. This is a rancher, probably our best customer at adopting technology. He runs about 2,000 cows. We're going to compare his 2008 born steers to this 2012 steers. Every steer he raised, so this is on about 750 steers. 8,000 was the index on the bulls in 2008, just, un just under 10.6 uh, on 2012. So he didn't prove the index. This is the uh, date they went into the feedlot. This is what they weighed going in in pounds. This is what they gained. So basically the cattle were a month younger. They were about the same weight. They gained more per day. They finished at a significantly heavier weight. Here's the cool one. And their dry matter intake per day went down. Same feedlot, same ration. And their feed conversion improved fairly substantially. And the dressing percentage went up. And the carcass weight went up. And the ribeye area went up. And the yield grade, our prediction of red meat yield, stayed the same. And the percent and upper two-thirds of choice went up. Translating that into dollars, keeping the feed the cost the same and the end base market the same, those cattle in four years were $122 per head better. Okay, big numbers. I think unprecedented numbers in beef cattle. Um, just a typical or prototypical steer at a 907-pound pound carcass weight with a 16.2-inch ribeye, graded upper two-thirds choice, converted 4.5 to 1, returned $1,800 to the ranch before he entered the feedlot. Huge number. Um, this is the test herd that does the feed efficiency study. That herd, that first year's data I showed you, averaged 6 to 1. That herd just uh, in 2013, five years later, averaged 4.8 to 1. The best sire groups now coming out of that test herd are converting very close to 4 to 1. So we've dramatically improved that. Um, obviously, the cattle still have to work out in the field. They have to have the structural soundness and all the things that, that the producers want out on the ranch, and, and, and we think they still have that. We're decreasing mature size. We're increasing performance. We're gaining on conversion, and we're changing um, the, the harvest weight, all the things in a positive direction. So that's kind of an overview of what we're doing. Um, not, I think, surprising to you as geneticists that multi-trade indexes work. Um, maybe surprising at how fast we can move beef cattle, I think. I don't, I don't know that at any time that I've looked at any data over the last 20 years, I've seen a population that's moving at that rate of change. Obviously, those chickens were. I mean, they were making, you know, real-time change that was easy to observe. But I think we can do that in beef cattle as long as we have our selection criteria correct. So that's kind of the outline. Steve's told me to finish with about 10 minutes for questions, yep. and I think I'm close to yep, pretty good. being on that. All right. Questions for, for Lee? Go ahead. Um, you know, I think you said you had clients that were like about 64 years old. Yeah. And that seems like you're going to need to put a whole lot of education into <laughs> those people that keep them as your clients. And what are your competition doing? Probably a bit of everything, isn't there? I mean, like in any marketplace, it's pretty fragmented. You know, we're, we're the, one of the top three largest, but we still would only have about a 2% market share. You know, market's highly fragmented. Um, obviously, there's a large segment of seed stock producers breeding hybrids, and a lot of them would be using indexes generated by breed associations. Those indexes tend to be what I call partial indexes. They cover one of the phases, but perhaps not all of the phases. Um, I think we're just at an inflection point in terms of adoption of index technology at the, at the seed stock level. It's going to take time for that to trickle down to the commercial level. But it, it's driven by commercial success, right? If my, if my sale averages go up, more people copy me. I mean, that's just, as, you know, that's just the driver, right? And right now, my sale averages are very high. We'll, we'll average almost $7,000 on 1,500 bulls this year. And that would be about $3,000 higher than national average. 
And so that's catching people's attention. And then when our calves sell, a lot of calves are marketed in the United States on videos. So they're large broadcasts of videos. There could be a video sale about every weekend at this time of the year, and they'll sell 50 to 100,000 calves. And those calves will typically be identified as their genetic source. And now ours are scored with a scorecard, and then they see what we're predicting on the premium, and then the calves bring a premium. Those kind of signals will make the market change. But, you know, I would say we're <coughs> a decade or two from having large-scale adoption of these techniques, which for me is a mixed blessing, right? It gives me more time to get ahead. It gives my customers more time to get ahead. And so it's, it's not a bad thing. But it, it is, education's a problem. At the end of the day, if, if you can materially change their economics, they'll adopt, as long as they don't have to change their management. And of course, this doesn't require managerial change. This is, you're raising the same cattle. Um, and so it, it makes it pretty simple. If they had to retain ownership all the way through to harvest to get these advantages, that would have been a big stumbling block because they weren't gonna change that. By getting them paid when they wanna sell those cattle as storage cattle, that's, that's a game changer, big time game changer, I think. So uh, it's, it's coming, it's coming. But you know, the, the, there's always the problem that uh, success breeds complacency. And in the industry right now, there's a lot of profitability. And so there's very little incentive for people to change right now. Now, as the market turns down and people get <coughs> lulled into high costs, and then these high markets basically dry up as we increase supply, which is gonna happen, over the next five to 10 years, then we're gonna see a lot of pressure. And I think then we'll see a lot of change. But good question. Nicholas. Excuse me, um, what is your opinion on selection for <coughs> residual feeding day? Yeah, it's a great question. And we usually get a lot of questions about how we select for feed efficiency. Um, I don't think any of those measurements but let me ask you a question. Why don't we select for milk with reproduction held constant? Why wouldn't we do that? Because obviously we'd like milk to go up, but not if reproduction goes down, right? But we don't do that, right? Because why would we do that? That'd be, that'd be a confusing way to look at it. But we want to select for feed efficiency with other traits held. At the end of the day, the math is really simple. If output goes up and input goes down, I make more money. So the only trait I really want to measure is intake. I've already been measuring growth for a long time. I think we have pretty good measures of growth. I think actually if we serially measured growth, we'd have better predictions of growth than we have, and we're starting to use some of those models. But at the end of the day, I just need to know what the intake is. I need to know what the intake is. I don't really want to select for RFI. I don't really even want to select for feed to gain. I want to get my genetic trend on intake appropriate, and, it, and appropriate is going to be somewhere between flat to slightly down, I think, and, and that'll depend on what happens to fertility in the long run. I don't think we can take that genetic trend on intake and keep going like that and not impact fertility at some point. And when we impact fertility, then we'll decide where we're going to level that off, and then the, the trend on output has to continue to be up, in my opinion. But ultimately, we really don't care what those genetic trends are if the simulation model's right. If the simulation model's right and we're selecting for the highest change, rate of change and profitability, we just let those trends find their own place, okay? In other words, we don't look at those genetic trends and say, oh, let's change that. We look at the simulation model and say, what does it drive? And then that's what we follow, okay? And I think because of that, Selection on any, you know, when you get into feed to gain or residual average daily gain or feed conversion, they all go out the window. It's all about rate of change and profit. One last question with Suzanne over here. Yeah. Do you have any feel that if there's an interaction between the, the system and the cost you're dumping on the efficiency that you're looking for? Yeah. yeah. Really good question. The question basically hinges on whether the quality of the diet is going to change what we're selecting for. Because obviously we have, we have ranchers that are running on very extensive country on low-quality forage. We have some ranchers that are running on abundant low-quality forage. We have some ranchers that are running on abundant high-quality forage. And then we put these calves in the feedlot and we give them a high-energy diet. And so how do we optimize that across the different areas? The, the first 
answer the question is there's not a lot of good data on that. And if you understand the, the constructs of setting up those studies, you can't serially measure on one and then the other without creating <coughs> factors you can't, you can't take back out of the model. So you really can't tell is the first question. From what we've seen, we, we hypothesize at this point that what we're selecting for ultimately is efficiency at a cellular level. Uh, we're, we're selecting for efficiency of, of not throwing off too much heat when you synthesize into protein and fat. Okay? That's what it looks like the same experiments in mice have shown, and there are obviously many generations down the road. If that's true, then that efficiency will apply on that low quality forage and that high quality forage, if that's true. There is different constraints. When we're on the low quality forage, basically animals are limited by how much volume they can eat, the beef cattle are. And then on the high quality forage, they're really limited by how much energy they can handle. So what we see is if we measure a set of animals on a high quality forage diet, on a, on a high quality grain diet, in the feedlot, the range in intake compresses. Okay? And in that environment, gain and feed efficiency are very highly correlated. Okay? If we measure on a very low quality roughage ration, we get much bigger ranges in intake, <coughs> and we get a much lower correlation between gain and conversion. Okay? Um, the take home message for us is we measure both, okay? I showed you that, that chart where we measured feed conversion on roughage in the bulls and then we showed you the outcome on their steer progeny on concentrate and those were pretty highly correlated. And so we, we think we're okay making that extrapolation. We think that as we select downward on intake and upward on growth, that when we put those cattle in a high energy diet, they respond very well. We just have to be careful that we don't take the intake down to where the cattle can't respond well on a very low energy diet. So that's, that's kind of our practical application. We've thought about whether we split that into two traits and separate the selection and, and maybe run them as correlated traits, but the, 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 the reality is at this point, we don't have enough data to do that. I think as we do, we will separate it out. We'll find some nuance in that but I don't think we're gonna find something that <coughs> radically upheaves what we've been modeling at this point. Seems that the model's working pretty well. Okay. Um, we got some two concurrent sessions starting up now, but uh, Lee, on behalf of uh, New Zealand Society of Animal Production, I'd like to give you some. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you.